from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Meg Metcalf, uh, women's gender, thank you, uh, an LGBT studies librarian for the main reading room. So today's lecture is jointly hosted by the Humanities and Social Sciences Division and our friends in the Hispanic Division. Um, um, and we are very excited to welcome Dr. Eugenia Tarzabachi to speak with us today. Uh, Dr. Tarzabachi holds a degree in psychology from the University of Buenos Aires and a postgraduate specialization in education from the University of San Andres. She was awarded her PhD with honors in 2014 from the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Buenos Aires, and the results of her dissertation research are the topic of her lecture today. In addition to her many academic achievements, Dr. Tarzabachi has also worked in governmental and non-governmental organizations where she has worked to foster gender equity, particularly in the field of sexual and reproductive health and education. This year, she was awarded a scholarship to conduct her postdoctoral research at the University of Buenos Aires, and her current research focuses on meanings about menstruation and menstrual management technologies for women of different ages and social status in Buenos Aires. Additionally, Dr. Tarzabachi is working on writing a book based on her dissertation, as well as a documentary film on menstrual bodies and new ways to talk about menstruation with girls and boys. Um, also, just a heads up, we, even though the flyer said um, 2 to 3, we might also go over a little bit till 3.30 today. So on a more personal note, it is beyond gratifying to see a scholar conduct research here at the Library of Congress and then come back to share their incredible work with us. So without further ado, please join me in giving the warmest of welcomes to Dr. Eugenia Tarzabachi as she presents Feminine Protection, Menstrual Bodies, Gender, and the Transnational Femcare Industry in the United States and Argentina. Thank you, Meg. And first of all, thank you all for being here, especially in this rainy day here in Washington, D.C. Let me spend just a couple of minutes in the acknowledgements because there are always many people uh, behind the accomplishment we can achieve. So I especially want to thank Megan Metcalf, Catalina Gomez, and uh, Mary Champagne because on behalf of the Division of Social uh, Sciences and Humanities, in collaboration with the Hispanic Division of the Library of, Cong of Congress, they made possible this presentation. So it's a great honor for me to be here with you sharing some of the results of my doctoral research, which was nurtured by my work here at this library that I deeply, deeply love. Um, this institution was so generous to me that this presentation here is a gesture of my gratitude for hosting me in many short term uh, stays over the years. Here I found some cultural studies of menstruation, uh, while in Argentina there was none. My doctoral research opened a new area of uh, study in the field of feminist academic research in, Ar in Argentina. So I also want to thank all the researchers on menstrual cycle whose previous work were, was crucial and helped me arrive to these results. I won't be able to give credit to all of them given the format of this presentation, but here on the screen are some of the most important for me. I also want to thank the Interdisciplinary Institute of Gender Studies uh, of the University of Buenos Aires for hosting my doctoral research, and also to my mentors, Monica Surmuk and Dora Barrancos. I finally want to publicly thank my sister, Eleonora, who is here, and her husband, Indy, who hosted me in their house with great love and support, all the trips I made to work on my intellectual inquiries here at the Library of Congress. So let's get uh, into what gathered us today. Uh, the presentation is titled, as Meg said, Feminine Protection, Menstrual Bodies, Gender, and the Transnational Femcare Industry in the United States and Argentina. This pre presentation highlights some of the key findings of my doctoral dissertation uh, that was titled A Genealogy on, of Menstrual Bodies Through Feminine Protection in the technologies in the US and Argentina between 1920 and 1980. 
my doctoral thesis, um, in this doctoral thesis, I used the term genealogy inspired by the work of Michel Foucault, trying to understand discontinuities in the discourses about women's bodies as menstruators. So to perform this recon reconstruction, I conducted a thorough analysis from the 1920 um, to the 1980s as it relates to the rhetoric exposed in advertisements, mostly graphic, of pads and tampons in the social context where these images circulated in both countries. I reviewed more than 400 ads. I also looked for the most significant patents, um, the educational materials produced by the main companies of this industry, and the experiences of women about the menstrual body, as well as the meaning that these modern technologies represented for those who lived through the transition from the rag, cloths, and cotton, um, or reusable homemade products, to manufacture and disposable ones. And as it relates to the latter analysis, and in order to understand what happened in Argentina, I interviewed 30 Argentine women uh, during, uh, that were, um, who were teenagers and young adults during the 70s when the tampon was launched in that, in that country. To retrieve equivalent data in the United States, I relied on background research. I also conducted interview with managers of multinational brands um, of feminine protection products in Argentina and in the US. And I also interview Argentine gynecologists who were practicing medicine in the 70s. The transnational dimension of this study is aligned with the idea of understanding the relations between these two countries instead of doing a comparison, although sometimes we know that it's unes unescapable. I supported this uh, study in transnational feminist cultural studies, a tradition started by Kaplan and Gruen in 1994. You may wonder why did I concentrate uh, in the relation between the US and Argentina, and I cannot say that the emergence of the femcare industry uh, was initiated in the US, but the main companies and brands that introduced the innovation of disposable and manufactured pads and tampons in Argentina were Americans. That is why the counterpoint with the U.S. was crucial. These companies disseminated this dis the disposable pads and tampons in steps, first the pads, then the tampons, from the upper and middle social sectors to uh, medium and low, and from the center to the periphery. Uh, this means from the central to the peripheral countries and from the central to the peripheral areas inside the national borders. Such has been the consolidation of this industry internationally that, as Bobel said, its annual earnings at the beginning of the 21st century were around $17 billion uh, in global sales and is still expanding, mainly by the growth of emerging economies. Currently, in the United States, the four major companies competing in this market are Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, Johnson & Johnson, and Playtex products. All by Playtex are the ones that developed ex uh, extensive multinational operations, and in Argentina, Johnson & Johnson ranked first in the local market of pads and tampons since the early 30s uh, with the introduction of Modest Pads brand to the present. So as I mentioned, uh, in my research, I focused in the period of time between 1920 uh, to 1980. Um, I wanted to include the, include the whole period of time in which the pads and tampons were launched in both countries. In this presentation, I will be extending that genealogy of menstrual bodies to the present to introduce and close this lecture today. The reason for that is that those discourses on women's menstrual bodies are unstable, unstable and in dispute nowadays. Also because what is currently going on only can be deeply understood considering what happened during the 20th century. So I want to start this presentation describing three current public situations that took place in Western societies and went viral in social media. Each of them, in different ways, expose that in the 21st century, what is popularly known as the menstrual taboo, menstrual taboo is not only still alive, but also is regulating women's bodies and lives in the shadows. So the first situation 
uh, was in August 2016, the Olympic Games. Fu Yanghui, a Chinese competitive swimmer, got the fourth place in the competition. She apologized for, to her team because she could not uh, do her best performance, given that she had her period the night before the competition and she had menstrual cramps. Let's hear from her about the motion of shame that is so intimately that so intimately constitutes the corporeal experience of menstruators in our societies and particularly in traditionally masculine f uh, fields such as sports. Okay, so this disclosure seemed to be a revelation, as if uh, it was a novelty that sport women, as the majority of women in reproductive age, do menstruate every month and continue with their regular activities. So let's move on to the second analyzer, also related to sports. However, this one could be considered as part, as the, of the, as part of the current menstrual activism. This is important because what you will see in this situation is also, also an emotion of self-evaluation, but the opposite emotion to shame, pride. So the second situation is, uh, was in April 2015 in the London's Marathon. Kiran Gandhi also uh, had a choice to skip her first marathon because of her period or run the marathon, and she decided to run the marathon and practice free bleeding for sisters who don't have tampons. This is the image of the end of the marathon, and she was criticized as being disgusting. The third situation in March 2015 uh, Instagram removed twice uh, this picture from the, pro from the photographer Rupi Kaur for considering it offensive. This picture was part of her essay on visual rhetoric on a visual rhetoric course at the university she attends. I will read the answer of Rupi Kaur to Instagram by the end of this presentation. So what I would like you could remember of these three anecdotes is that the public reaction to what these women disclosed are proportional to the success of a process that occurred during the 20th century and in which the femme care industry has uh, had a, a significant protagonism. The idea that I would like you could uh, gently keep in mind until the end of the presentation is that with the efficient concealment of the menstrual body, what was better concealed under the, under the discourse of women's liberation was the menstrual stigma. In other, words, in other words, we can say that the menstrual closet, a concept that I borrow from Iris Marion Young, Iris Marion Young was better locked and hidden. So next in this presentation, I will try to show you that the disposable and manufactured pads and tampons, which were massively launched in the United States and Argentina at the beginning of the 20th century, were far more than innocent modern technologies of menstrual management. Let's remember that before the commercialization and massive consumption of industrial pads and tampons, each woman, each woman had to uh, handle what to do with its own menstrual blood every month, and women weren't allowed to do many activities during menstruation, like taking cold baths or doing energetic movements. In the US and in Argentina, what women usually used were cloths, rags, and cotton. Sometimes they added pins, pins to hold the homemade pads in place. The massive dissemination and consumption of these products helped women gain a sense of uh, self-control over their own bodies. They also helped them manage menstruation in a standardized and practical way uh, with increasing comfort and at a less emotional cost. Furthermore, they increased the, pro the productivity of women's bodies at different levels by letting them perform a socially acceptable feminine body before others and remain active every day of the month. So the question is how they, de they did all that. 
And the answer is by normalizing the menstrual body gradually under the ideal of a feminine body which, for which menstruation was under control. The process implied two major tactics. The first one, and most, most fundamental, is, uh, was effectively concealing, not suppressing, all the evident traces of menstruation given its consideration as abject, while letting women be more productive every day of the month. This meant uh, a decreased anxiety related to the self-surveillance over, over the evidence of the existence of a menstrual body. Manufacture and disposable pads and tampons help women avoid in a more efficient way the stain, the smell, the visual traces of a homemade pad, and also they were disposable. So women did not have to worry about finding a place to hide the product for its storage or where to dry them without being seen by men. And finally, the improvements in terms, in terms of comfort made women get rid of the permanent self-awareness about the menstrual condition without suppressing menstruation. That is why I conceptualize them by using the Freudian concept of denial as technologies of effective denial of the menstrual body's traces. The second major tactic uh, was the following. The industrial pads and tampons were disseminated alongside alongside a new legitimized way of thinking and talking about menstruation, which was supported by the biomedical modern knowledge. This new way of doing, thinking, and talking about menstrual, menstruation uh, that this industry disseminated transnationally displaced gradually the traditional knowledge of women about menstruation. The work of Lara Friedenfeld, Shara Bostral, and Elizabeth Kissing, uh, Kisling was crucial, were crucial um, to understand what happened in the US. The dissemination of industrial pads and tampons transnationally helped women disidentify with that old fashioned menstrual body that by being commanded by traditional practices around menstruation could not hide properly all the traces of menstruation and remain passive or inhibited during, during the menstrual period. And finally, the powerful connotation of the disposability of the blood and the products was helpful for that disidentification process. It had resonances with a metaphor of an abject body, an old-fashioned menstrual body that could also be discarded. However, the monstrous menstrual body was kept alive under wraps. So in conclusion, Industrial pads and tampons were and are far more than technolo technologies of menstrual management. I will show you that they are a prism to understand how its transnational dissemination and consumption in the US and in Argentina produced a new disciplinary practice towards women's bodies that normalized menstruation. In a long-term basis, this new disciplinary practice not only concealed menstruation in a more efficient way and provided a new way of thinking, talking, and managing menstruation. In a broader perspective, they also reproduced traditional narratives about gender and helped to conceal the menstrual taboo or stigma while maximizing women's productivity every day of the month. I would love to share many really fascinating uh, details and complexities of this process, but as I don't have enough time for that, this afternoon I will focus on the portrayals of women's bodies as menstruators in the transnational discourses that the femcare industry used to disseminate the pads and the tampons as feminine protectors. I will focus on the two main ways to, to do this dissemination, which were in hierarchical orders, the, in hierarchical order, the advertising and the educational material, materials in both countries between 1920 uh, and 1980. So let's first make some sense about the title of this dissertation, uh, this presentation. Um, this image is just uh, one of the first advertisements of Kimberly Clark's br uh, brand of feminine pads called Cotex. And it is very simple, but it is revealing. I selected it because its main syntagma is explicit and crucial to understand a cultural constru construction about gender related to the menstrual condition of women's bodies that the market and the, the feminine protection rhetoric helped sustain for almost a century through the technologies in question. Women lose because they menstruate. 
That is to say that women lose blood and they also lose in the social field because of their natural deficient bodies, not because the cultural corporeal ideal of Western societies that is a non-menstrual uh, ideal like male bodies are. Um, I want to bring here Elizabeth Cross' consideration about the continuous reinscriptions that the Western culture made about women's corporealities as a seepage. According to Gross, women's bodies were socially constructed as an un uncontrolled, chaotic fluidity, a content with no solid container. Since the beginning of the 20th century, that rhetoric reinforced a particular metaphor about women as victims of their natural, weak, vulnerable, and problematic bodies, given that they menstruate. Menstruation was portrayed uh, as an enemy opposed to the social equity of women. That is uh, why the pads and tampons were feminine protectors. So I won't talk much about the euphemisms that the industry used to refer to menstruation or the products at the beginning of the 20th uh, century. I won't even talk about the visual denegations to refer to menstruation. Uh, that is already a fact that many research studies have already concluded. What I would like to do now is to unfold the metaphors of menstrual bodies reproducing the history of pads and tampons uh, advertising in the US and Argentina, using the menstrual taboo to conceal not only the blood, but the menstrual stigma itself. So let's take a look at the story of the feminine uh, protection rhetoric, rhetoric in the advertising, uh, in the advertisements. I organized um, what you will see in a chronological timeline. So we will be traveling from the 20s to the, the end of the 70s, back and forth between a central country like the US to a peripheral one like Argentina. From the analysis, I can, it can be observed that the masculine protective power of pads and tampons over women worked very close to the sanitation of a menstrual body considered dirty until the 50s, capitalizing the hygienist discourse. And from the 60s on, uh, the feminine protection worked in solidarity with the liberation of women uh, of, of women from a, an oppressive menstrual body, capitalizing the cultural power of a uh, women's liberation movement, of the women's liberation movement. So in the first uh, period, what I call the first period of feminine protection, um, I will be showing you the anachronistic uh, feminine protection rhetoric divided into these two periods in both countries. The first one goes from the 20s to the 50s, and the protection of this chaotic, vulnerable, and problematic menstrual body was linked with its sanitation because that body was also considered dirty. This period uh, coincided with the release of the first generation of both products in the US and just the modern sanitary pads in Argentina. In these periods, we will see images like this one, a woman in panic, <laughs> because she was discovered by others as menstrual. We can understand this particularity not only as a commercial strategy that worked uh, explicitly around shame, an ashamed and dirty body that could not integrate into the society, this portrayal can be understood as a reflection of an ongoing process of disidentification from that old menstrual body that used to fail in the concealment. That process was not complete yet. Disposable tampons and pads were still massively consumed. This is another example of an Argent Argentine uh, advertis advertisement. It says, uh, scared, no more uncertainties. Modest, the, the safe sanitary napkin. So the second period of feminine protection that coincided with the second generation of both technologies started in the 60s. By a second generation of these products, I mean the innovation of the adhesive and later uh, different sizes and wings in the pads. And uh, the second generation of tampons in the US meant tampons that could expand uh, longitudinally, not radially, and also the tampons with, with no applicator, with fragrances that were unnecessary, etc. 
In Argentina, the innovation of the tampon as a menstrual management technology was systematically presented in society through advertisements from the late 60s and 70s, approximately 40 years later than here in the US. And the one that is most consumed from the uh, um, the one that is most cons consumed in Argentina is the OV, OV, the digital tampon, with no applicator. So let's also remember that the tampon, as a technology of uh, vaginal penetration, uh, awakened many social and individual uh, anxieties related with women's sexualities, and is a very interesting analyzer of the social regulation of women's sexualities in, 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 each, in each of these countries. During this period, the protection of a chaotic and vulnerable menstrual body was linked with the liberation of women, considered as subjects uh, socially oppressed by, the, by their own natural menstrual bodies. In these periods, we can register anymore the representation of an ashamed woman that could be discovered by others as menstrual. This advertising uh, strategy coincided with a process of disidentification of that old menstrual body that was started to be consolidated. So this is just a general classification of two periods to clarify uh, different metaphors of menstrual bodies according to really big tendencies that, that I could found. Uh, protection, hygiene, and freedom were three signifiers that work together and acquire different accents due to the historical context. They were a stable uh, tripod of um, meanings that the femme care industry used to portray women's bodies as menstruators. So with these new modern products, the imperative of rest during menstruation that prevailed at the beginning of the 20th century started to be fractured. So let's start with the first period. You will see highlighted in yellow the word uh, protection or references to safety, and in blue the word hygiene or sanitation. And given the time constraints, I will go over each relevant ad uh, fairly fast, but there are many, many interesting things um, about it of each of them. I will spend just a couple of minutes in this uh, foundational image published published in 1921 in the Ladies Home Journal. This is the first ad of Got Expats, which, use, which used the discourse of patriotism to launch the brand and the technology into the American market after the First World War. In this ad, what was used is an analogy be between the pad as a protector of a vulnerable woman that menstruates and the soldiers who were fighting to protect protect the American nation, a feminized uh, entity as it was under, un, uh, uh, under the threat of a, of a war. And also menstruation is aligned with the idea of the enemy. The word protection, you will see that it doesn't have a strong presence in this first ad, but the general connotation of this image is around a feminine protection given by a masculine and American figure. The ad says to save a uh, man's life, science discovered cortex. And this ad led us to a keynote. Uh, you may know that the feminine pads designed to manage menstruation were, as many other modern technologies, a consequence, consequence of war. This is one of the products created for the war that after the end of the war had a civilian use. The cellucotton, a higher absorbent material and cheaper than cotton, was produced by Kimberly Clark in 1915 due to the rising prices of the cotton after the American Civil War. So Kimberly Clark used to sell it to hospitals as surgical dressings. In 1917, when the US entered into the First World War, the company started to sell this product to the American Army and the Red Cross. And after signing the armistice in 1918, the army canceled the contract with Kimber Kimberly Clark and, co and tons of cellu cotton and many fabric that produced it were remaining as a potential business loss. So Kimberly Clark decided to capitalize both actives and transform the cellu cotton into a feminine pad. As Heinrich, Heinrich and Bachelor said in their book on Kimberly Clark, the only one factor that could persuade a businessman to think about the menstrual condition of women at the beginning of the past century was a potential profit loss. 
Um, it is also said that the idea of this derivation of the salute cotton into a feminine pad came from the American found of wounded women to Kimberly Clark, saying that the nurses of the American army used to improvise the use of salute cotton surgical dressings as feminine pads. So they call it cotex, referring to cotton-like texture. Now the text will have some sense to all of us. I will just read some parts. Our boys were falling wounded in the battlefield of France. Army doctors were calling for an unlimited supply of antiseptic surgical dressing that would be more absorbent than cotton. The government said, can you give us such a surgical dressing? We could and did, a war emergency. Men working in, the, in feverish haste built a great plant here near the forest district of the north and a wonderful surgical dressing was produced. Hundreds of thousands of pounds were shipped to our war hospitals to save men's lives. Many a sorely wounded soldier has reason to thank American scientific inventive genius to this great practical discovery, a permanent peacetime utility. Now that the war is over, we are devoting this great factory to peacetime usefulness. We have called this wonderful product Cotex, Cotex Texture, and before long, Cotex will be available in restrooms, dry, dry goods, departments, and drug, store, drug stores all over the country. So the cost is almost nothing. Our plant was built to fill a war need. Enormous production was demanded. We will keep that production up and keep down the cost Cotex are cheap enough to throw away. So this is a foundational uh, beginning of the transnational feminine care rhetoric to advertise, uh, in this case, pads, without mentioning not only menstruation, but neither the product they were uh, advertising. So let's move on in this first uh, journey. Next, let's take a look at uh, this ad published in 1927 uh, by Johnson & Johnson in the Syracuse Herald to present in society its feminine pad, Modest, a derivation of the word modesty. At that time, Johnson & Johnson started to compete with Kimberly Clark for market share. It says a personal word uh, to women from Johnson & Johnson. We ask you what a modern hygienic convenience should be like, mm -hmm. you, and you told us. Then we experimented our 41 years experience in making Red Cross cotton, gauze, and surgical supplies helped us. So modest and comfortable, it gives uh, absolute protection. It is easily uh, disposable. Modest is the truly modern hygienic convenience designed for the active modern woman. Modest is all you need to say, ready ra wrapped uh, at most drugstores, designed by women for women. So there is a story also behind this ad because Johnson & Johnson to uh, release this brand, uh, they hired a, a PhD in psychology, Gilbert, um, that study how was the best part for the five senses of women. Uh, so after that study, they, they released this brand. And there is a beautiful paper of um, made by Bostrel and Fouchette about this, uh, the Silver's report. So the aim of this new product was uh, more comfort for women, but also a better concealment of the product. The allusion to the active modern women that needed a new way to manage menstruation will remain stable. In 1928, uh, Kimberly Clark launched in the Saturday Evening Post many ads like this one, uh, in a new campaign that portrayed upper-class women using cotex as a sign of social distinction. Kimberly Clark made a rhetoric shift from the previous ad. Cotex protection and hygiene was no more a matter of a national convenience. It was a sign of social distinction. So this, says, this one says, um, this ends the worries of full-time hygienic methods by providing protection that is absolute. And this other one says, the safe solution for, of a women's greatest hygienic problem, which eight in 10 better class women have adopted. So you will see from now on until the 60s approximately that the, the menstruation was portrayed as a problem, a feminine problem. <clears throat> So 
So let's move to this image. Uh, I picked this advertisement published in 1933 in the New York Times by Kimberly Clark because of this insistence of the protection and the equalizer effect between men and women that this new technology was pretending to bring about for women. Let's remember that the right uh, for, for women to vote, as men did, was passed in 1921, and that, that, sees, uh, that is another important milestone, milestone of the American history that was capitalized by the first ads of pads and tampons. It says, now great advance in sanitary protection, equalizer cortex, gives 20 to 30 greater protection. And now we arrive to another memorable advertisement of this story. It is the one that introduced the, tampa, the tampon tampax in 1936. The quality of the image is not good at all, but I can tell you that there are many women represented in action, uh, riding horses, playing tennis, using swimsuits, swimsuits uh, thanks to the protection that could, could be worn uh, internally. This technological innovation was portrayed as revolutionary for women, uh, corporeal experience as menstruators. And it, is, it was because it gave a, a step forward, not only in the habilitation of doing many activities that require water or energetic movements, because uh, the leaking threat was better solved. Furthermore, the menstrual management technology itself could not be seen by anyone else than a woman. So tampons were launched as a way to remade women's tortured existence with this new way to fixing their deficient body. But they released tampons with a nicer translation than what I did. They said, welcome to this new day for womanhood. This summer you can experience a comfort and an assurance of daintiness you have never known before. Sanitary protection worn internally or this other uh, advertisement that says, Woman's World Remade. So around the same year that the tampons were launched in the American market, in Argentina, Johnson & Johnson was started, at least in advertising, to release the feminine pads. Uh, these ads published in a feminine magazine that still is, exists and is called Para Ti, For You, are part of the first ads, first ads of Modest Brown I found. As you can tell in the image of the last, they use the representation of a woman with a very short masculine haircut called a la garçon. The equalizer effect of men and women by the use of this menstrual management technology was connoted here too. It says something like every woman needs modest the sanitary napkin that will give you the most perfect and absolute protection during the days of indisposition. This is a traditional way of uh, referring to menstruation in Argentina. Get a box of Modest in any pharmacy or store and you will prove why Modest gives a complete protection. A product, a product of Johnson & Johnson, modern, uh, Modest, this modern sanitary pad. The image in the middle of the slide uh, also showed upper class women under a title that says the modern solution of an old feminine problem. Notice the same insistence on the, on the consideration of menstruation as a hygienic problem of female bodies that could turn into a crisis because of what they referred as an accident during those days. And the third ad used the image of a nurse, the only one feminine representation of medicine, at that time to declare in the title a new chapter in feminine hygiene with this safe and comfortable system, Modest, the safe sanitary napkin. The insistence with the modern way to manage menstruation of a modern woman in contrast with the old fashioned methods and women that were prisoners of a problematic <coughs> menstrual body was strongly emphasized in, Argentine, in the Argentine uh, advertisements of the novelty of this product. Let's take a look at this in the first ad of uh, a national brand, uh, national pad brands in Argentina. Um, the ad of the left of the uh, of the left of the slide used a title that resounds with some ads, some other ads we have already read. How the modern woman uh, solves her hygienic problem. 
The ad of the right uh, side of the slide uh, showed the dialogue between Luisa, an old-fashioned woman, and the modern woman. The, woman, the modern woman, uh, who is seated in the chair, says, how outdated you are, Luisa. That is not a reason for not going to the party. What you have to do is try Sanatoasha, the marvelous sanitary napkin that is a solution for our problem. This national brand called Sanatoasha combines the word sanitation or, sanitation or health and napkin. The slogan was Sanatoasha, the modern sanitary napkin. And this one, this, this ad, I, I love this ad because this is uh, an isolated ad of a tampon in the 30s in Argentina, uh, or at least it's the only one that I could find in my review, published in 1939. It disappeared very quickly from the domain of advertising, and I could not find any other ad of this technology until, until the 60s in Argentina. This advertising reveals something that was not possible yet for Argentine women in the late 30s, probably given the more conservative context toward women's bodies and the smaller local, local market compared with the, uh, to the US. It was a national brand of a tampon uh, named Arp Sorbol. The name is a, is a homophone in Spanish of the English word absorbol. As you can tell again, uh, the Anglo-Saxon origin was an important source of legitim legitimacy of these products in Argentina. So let's move on to the ads introduced in the 40s and the 50s. They present many, many interesting stories. Uh, in those years, the use of feminine pads became products of massive consumption here in the US, while in Argentina, the companies were still trying to target the middle class women and in both countries, the increasing participation of women in the workforce as blue-collar workers uh, was represented into the ads to portray these technologies as a way to help women be active every workday. They continue using the representation of menstrual women as a desirable object for uh, the male gaze by concealing properly their menstrual condition, but also they were able to be economically productive, not only as consumers, but as active workers. There are differences uh, found in the way they portray women working in, the, in one country and the other due to particularities of each uh, social context. In the US, where women had to occupy men's work position while they were um, in the battlefield during the Second World War, Women workers were portrayed with traditionally masculine clothing like overalls and slacks or poses, open legs. In Argentina, they continue being represented with the traditional feminine clothing uh, like blouses, skirts and dresses and with all the traditionally feminine gestures uh, like cross legs uh, while, while seated. Let's take a look at the images. As you can see in the ad published in 1942 in Women's Home uh, Companion, the figure of the traditional feminine woman who is uh, the fan of her husband, uh, Farlow, while his sword is pointing her sexual organs, is balanced with a masculinized fem female worker. Both had to keep going during menstru menstruation. The Tampax ad on the middle says the, uh, those modern girls as never before need Tampax, showing a giant woman as a result of a low angle shot. Uh, she's standing with her legs open saying slacks, slacks, slacks. The polysemy of this word refers not only to the trousers, but also to a loose part. Something like a loose part of our bodies that was tightened by the tampon to become solid and hermetic. Let's remember here the ad women lose and the consideration of women as a seepage. Finally, the image of the right represented again the blue collar workers and Tampax as an ally of, of uh, capitalists, capitalists uh, to reduce female absenteeism during menstruation. And in the meanwhile, uh, ads like this one were published in 1945 the modern way to think about those days, physical educators now stress normalcy for this time of the month. As you can see in, uh, 
in this ad, this was part of a very strong process that had the intention of deepening the portrayal of menstruation as a completely normal biological process. This is a very, uh, there is a very interesting story mentioned by some authors like Bostral that refer to how in the US, particularly in the US, the normalization of menstruation was um, intense during the, the World Wars uh, World War's time period and how after the war the pathologizing of women because of menstruation was highlighted. The psychological distress related to hormones like the menstrual tension created by Robert Frank in 1936 or the PMS created by Katharina Dalton in 1952 are an example of that. This can be understood as a way of displacing women out of the workforce to let the, uh, men occupy again their places at work since th uh, they were coming back from the war. Aligned with this phenomenon, you can see the return of a traditional feminine stereotype of women in the campaign, Modest Because, that Johnson & Johnson released from, the 19, from 1948 uh, until the pad uh, brand Stay Free was launched in the 70s. So let's move to what happened in these decades in Argentina. Um, there were not as many representations of women working uh, in Argentina. There are some examples of them. Uh, the lowest uh, class status of the workers portrayed are connoted not only in the types of jobs they were performing, but also in the main syntagma of the ad of the left, left side of the slide, the bottoms of your suit are more expensive. The other two ads showed saleswomen at, uh, saleswomen at the store. There were also secretaries at office. In other ads, uh, I didn't select it for this presentation. But the topic of the absenteeism uh, that pads could prevent remained unmentioned. The paths for workers were portrayed as an ally to uh, perform the ideal feminine beauty also during menstru menstruation. So during the 50s, uh, there were less workers in the ads and more scenes of women's uh, menstrual bodies being active and impeccable housewives like this one. This ad, oh, sorry. It says, uh, are you or will you be a good housewife? And it's like a test. If you answer yes to the second question, uh, then you will be, in this case, a good housewife. There are, it's like a campaign. There are like five, it's a set of five images. Uh, for example, in the box, sorry that this is a little bit moved. In the box number two, it says, do you buy things because they are cheap without worrying about its quality? Or number two, do you prefer to buy many little things, products, uh, products instead of uh, depriving yourself of modest, modest, safe protection? Or in box number four, do you allow your discomfort to deny your uh, loved ones of your good mood and collaboration? <laughs> or number two, do you know how to take advantage of the comfort that modest provides and live your life under its safe protection? Just say modest. Um, other ads are like this one. Uh, traditional feminine women dancing in love with men without concerns with the safe protection of modest. Modest is not simply cotton. Its absorbance, absorbency power is far superior. Modest, especially designed for being invisible under the lightest stress. Just say modest. So let's move to the second period of feminine protection. Now we will, um, we will highlight the words protection in yellow and freedom in, in green. This rhetoric is very much alike um, to what we could appreciate from the last decades of the 20th century until the 2000s. Color, colorful ads, uh, women under the water during menstruation, the presentation of new brands referring to freedom, and a second generation of pads and tampons in the US, and also the presentation of the tampon in Argentina, are those the main characteristics of this period. 
I agree with uh, Shelley Parker in the shift that we can register in the advertisements of pads and tampons while the women's liberation movement was taking place in both countries. Um, this shift goes from the rhetoric of the sanitation of the menstrual body, as I told you, considered dirty, to the rhetoric of women's liberation of menstruation as an internal enemy for women. Just keep in mind that in Argentina during the, the 60s and the 70s, we had many di dictatorships uh, governments. Let's take a look at the ads of this second period. Nothing holds you back. This is an ad of Tampax, uh, published in 1968 in Family Circle. It says, uh, when, whatever you go, whatever you do, you are confident, comfortable, carefree, with the cool, clean, fresh protection of Tampax tampons. This is a uh, modern sanitary protection, the kind that belongs to the young, the alert, the ally. Uh, it even makes you feel more a part of the party. You get total freedom with Tampax. Or these two, um, between 1974 and 1976, these ads of new brands of pads introduced by Kimberly Clark and Johnson & Johnson were released. They, highlight, uh, they highlighted the word freedom uh, in their own names. New freedom displaced cortex and stay free displaced uh, modest. Um, they had, of course, this new generation had the ad ad adhesive backing as the one that we know in our days. As you can tell, teenagers were a clear tar target uh, for tampons in the 70s, while swimsuits had a very strong presence in advertisements. Um, this is like the new aesthetics of the 60s and the 70s. And in Argentina, for example, this ad, published in 1976 uh, in uh, Revista Clarín, which is a very traditional uh, magazine, um, this ad is a national brand of, of uh, a tampon in Argentina that, that was called Suavix. Uh, the ad says Suavix for women's liberation. The text talks about uh, menstruation as one of the last taboos and the visual connotation of menstruation related to an empty nest, can you see it right there? It's interesting because it refers to the hegemonic way to think about menstruation as an indicator or a trace of a, of a body that is feral but spoils its reproductive potential. It's an empty nest. If we have time, we will see one of the ways this interpretation of menstruation was disseminated. There are some um, tampon ads of national brands in feminine magazines during the 70s, but after the OB tampon of Johnson & Johnson um, was released, they disappear from the domain of advertising. Well, this is the second ad of, uh, that present the OB tampon in Argentina. You can, you can tell that there are women's in, women in bikinis running, going out from the sea. And the last stop in this first journey through the feminine protection rhetoric is the comparison of the simultaneous first ads to present the OB tampons in the US and Argentina. And I have to thank here to David Linton for putting me in contact with uh, Robert Weiner, who managed the public, uh, public relations of the OB brand for Johnson & Johnson uh, in the 70s here in the US and kindly share with me uh, the first OB American campaign of OB tampons for TV. This is a fixed image, just I captured that image. That, that is the end of the, of the advertising. I would like to show you the different ways in which this technology was presented in the ads, making a depolitized use of women's liberation discourse that was contemporary, and also the political use of the dictatorship discourse in Argentina that, among other things, censored feminism. During this period that goes from 1976 uh, to 1983, Argentina suffered its cruelest uh, dictator dictatorship of its uh, whole history. The state terrorism used the doctrine of national security against an internal enemy and the discourse of a total protection to disappear and kill 30,000 men and women due to their uh, ideological conventions about social justice. 
So in the US, the OB tampon was presented as a feminist technology because of three th main things. The first one is that it had to be inserted into the vagina with our own hands. Uh, let's remember that the discourse of the women's health, health movement here in the US used the symbol of the speculum as a way to call for women to explore their genitalia in the 70s. Second of all, because they portray an androgynous women, woman riding a bike, uh, running in a park, and using very, very loose clothing. And the ad still use uh, medicine as a figure of legitimacy, but they refer to a gynecologist woman as being the creator of OB tampons. This denoted that women could be professionals as men, and also that some essence of um, women's experience of menstrual bodies uh, could understand better women's needs. On the contrary, in Argentina, the OB tampon was presented as a feminine technology, not a feminist one, using the discourse of women's liberation, but in a very different way. It was the first ad of a menstrual management technology that showed, showed the inside of women's genitalia. I don't know if you can tell right there, um, in the left side. Let me see if I can point it with this. Right here, this is the inside of the genitalia, women's genitalia. Um, but they showed that image in a very pragmatic way, just to show where the tampon had to be inserted, uh, exposing that a pedagogy about women's anatomy was needed. The clitoris, of course, was omitted. This had uh, still used the discourse of the figure of a masculine medicine. They referred to the approval of this tampon by male gynecologists to legitimize the tampons. And the ads portrayed a sexy woman uh, moving uh, with no restrictions, but in the position of objects of male desire. The ad says tampon OB of Johnson & Johnson asks, the feminine protection you use, would you allow you to pose for this picture? In both cases, ads appropriated feminism in a depoliticized way to promote a technology that could hide more efficiently all the traces of menstruation. And something else was found in the ads of OB tampons in Argentina, where the society was invented, as I told you, in a great social anxiety that is reflected in this women's body's portrayal. The discourse of a feminine total protection to make reference to a bleeding that had to be hidden, had a strong resonances with the one that the dictators used to legitimize the aberrations that perpetrated during the, uh, what they called the, a dirty war to free Argentina. So what I try to show you uh, until now, at a glance, is that the uh, feminine uh, pr protection rhetoric that the uh, self-called femcare industry uh, use was a constant and it was transnational until our days with some twists according to the specific uh, social context where they were presented. They spread negative connotations about menstruation by giving a technological fix to the, that abject and deficient menstrual body in order to allow women maximize their productivity every day of the month. But at the same time, we wouldn't be fair with the feminine, uh, feminine care industry if we don't say that the companies also worked around a positive connotation about menstruation, given its relation, its relation with the female fertility. They highlighted this aspect in the educational materials uh, where they continued reproducing traditional narratives about gender while doing its pedagogy on this new modern uh, way to manage, behave, think and feel about menstruation. Let's remember here that the educational departments of the companies started their work at the 40s here in the US and around the 60s in Argentina. There are many educational pamphlets and film he films here in the US from the 40s, but I just found one pamphlet in Argentina produced by Johnson & Johnson at the end of the 60s. So let me show you one um, educational material, a memorable one, is the, the story of menstruation that Kimberly Clark asked Disney to produce in order to disseminate its products between the youngest. 
It was released in because this is what I wanted just to take a look. You could take a look. And now the disciplinary practice towards uh, femininity. Of course, a girl may be irregular during the first year or so, but after that, 
when her system is settled down into a routine, her period should always be about the same number of days apart and last about the same length of time. Try not to throw yourself off schedule by getting overtired, emotionally upset, or catching cold. And if your timing goes seriously <laughs> wrong, or you're bothered with severe cramps or headaches, you should have a talk with your doctor. Of course you'll want to keep a personal calendar. Mark the first day of each period yeah. and check to see that there are about the same number of days between periods. It's not only a useful record of past performance, but it comes in handy when you have to plan ahead. This calendar appears in an interesting booklet called Very Personally Yours. This booklet has been prepared to enlarge upon what you learn from this brief film. Among other things, the booklet explodes that old taboo against bathing during your period. Not only can you bathe, you should bathe. Because during menstruation, your perspiration glands are working overtime. Just be careful to avoid either very hot water or very cold water. In fact, it's not a good idea at any time to shock your system with extremes. <laughs> any more than to let yourself get chilled or to catch cold. And as for the old taboo against exercise, that's nonsense. Exercise is good for you during menstruation. Just use common sense. When you come to think of it, most of your daily routine is on the mild side. It's going to extremes that's wrong and to be avoided. Look at this, look at this. Some girls' period should bring no severe discomfort. Some girls have a little less pep, a feeling of pressure in the lower part of the body, perhaps an occasional twinge or a touch of nerves. But don't let it get you down. After all, no matter how you feel, you have to live with people. You have to live with yourself, too. And once you stop feeling sorry for yourself and take those days in your stride, you'll find it's easier to keep smiling and even-tempered. You can do practically everything you normally do. Not, not dancing, energetic, <laughs> rock. Exercises to relieve cramps are illustrated in the booklet. Try them. With the guidance of a qualified person, you may find they help. Sloppy <laughs> <laughs> posture is just as bad inside as it looks outside. So stand up straight and let the organs function from the position that nature intended. One way to help them function normally is to avoid constipation. You see, your reproductive organs lie between the rectum and the bladder and their external opening. And constipation will disturb the relationship between these organs. So you'll find it worth your while to drink plenty of water, eat plenty of fruit, and to include cereals and eggs and leafy vegetables in your daily diet. And incidentally, it's smart to keep looking smart. That well-groomed feeling will give you new poise and lift your morale, especially when it's backed up with year-round fresh air and sunshine and plenty of rest and sleep. Because the best possible insurance against trouble on those days is healthy living every day. And that's the story. There's nothing strange nor mysterious about menstruation. All life is built on cycles. And the menstrual cycle is one normal and natural part of nature's eternal plan for passing on the gift of life. It yeah. might be funny, but it's this was reproduced in the majority of the educational materials with some shifts, of course, but until the, the 80s. Um, so as Iris Marion Young pointed uh, out before, uh, such an insistence of the normalcy of menstruation is an indicator of its pathological consideration.
But let's go back to the positive connotation of her menstruation as the one that is generalized today in the educational materials for the youngest. That was crucial to complete the normalization of the menstrual body. The positive connotation of menstruation was portrayed like this. First of all, menstruation was a sign of the welcoming to womanhood. The traditional modism, becoming a young lady, or convertirse en señorita in Spanish, helped to hide what is a gender identity construction within the terror norm as a natural derivation from the pretended objective reality of the body. And in second place, when menstruation was explained in a scientific way from a medical perspective, reproduci reproducing uh, gender binaries through the figure of a natural sexed body with particular um, reproductive organs and horm hormones that allows the biological reproductive capability of female uh, organisms. We can continue unpacking the reinscription of traditional narratives around, about gender following the brilliant work of Emily Martin. On the one hand, menstruation was ex, uh, explained using the feminine stereotype of a passive egg that slowly comes down to the encounter of the masculine stereotype of an active sperm that conquers the egg, something really interesting uh, in these uh, materials produced in both countries between the 40s and the 80s is that the sperm uh, was never seen in the imagery that they provided. In other hand, on the other hand, menstruation was connoted as a waste, a natural and failed chance to be pregnant, be pregnant and be a mother someday, as if motherhood was the correct destiny of a woman because of her natural body. I have to say here that menstruation can also be explained within those scientific terms, for example, as a defense from the pathogens transported by sperms, by the sperm. The biologist uh, Margie Prophet has a very, very interesting paper on this topic. Furthermore, uh, the educational materials did something else. They represented an ideal menstruator, introducing many other disciplinary practice towards the body apart from concealing menstruation with feminine protection products. The ideal menstruator was a desirable and modern feminine young woman from the perspective of the masculine gaze, and the strong presence of the mirror in these materials is a strong connotation of that gaze that was portrayed as a starting to regulate the feminine existence since the monarchy. So let's take just a quick look at the presence of the uterus, of course embedded in this narrative uh, about the reproductive capability of women's bodies and the mirror in some of these materials. This was published in 1952, and it had new editions in 1959 and 1961. You are a young lady now. Uh, it was a pamphlet produced by Kimberly Clark. Uh, there you can tell that the image of the mirror is a constant. In Molly Grows Up, it, it was another film produced by Johnson & Johnson in 1953. There you have the teacher that is explaining almost the same thing that we saw in the story of menstruation about the, the what is menstruation related to, to the reproductive uh, capability of women's bodies. And then Molly in front of the mirror uh, when she was just about to have her menarche. This is uh, another pamphlet, It's Wonderful Being a Girl, published in 1986, uh, produced by Johnson & Johnson, the same thing. And this is the only one material that I told you that I found in this period in Argentina. It was called Learn to be a Woman, a Confidential Message for uh, Female Teenagers. This was a pamphlet produced by Johnson & Johnson. And one really interesting thing is that the imagery of the uterus and, and, and the, the, the internal part of uh, women's genitalia is not seen uh, in these uh, educational materials in Argentina. So uh, it's also, it, it also men makes sense with the advertisements of uh, OB tampons that there was a pedagogy that was still uh, remaining in Argentina for women. For women, sorry. Um, and there is um, a short but very powerful paper on this written by Dacia Charlesworth that applied perfectly, perfectly well to characterize the ideal menstruator, menstruator in these educational materials. 
In her study of American pamphlets from 1959 to 1998, uh, she summarized exceptionally well that the ideal menstruator had to be a mother someday, had to use the proper scientific names when discussing the menstrual cycle, has to uh, discuss menstruation with other women and trusted uh, adults only, but will not be confident with uh, when discussing menstruation with others. Although she doesn't feel her best, she will not use menstruation as an excuse for behaving badly. She will know that menstruation should be kept in secret. She will practice using feminine protection products before the need arises. She will be willing to engage in bodily surveillance, and she will use the various feminine protection products uh, mentioned in the, pa in the pamphlets. Um, it's interesting because uh, if you um, analyze these materials, you can tell that in the US until the end of the 50s, uh, they just recommended fa uh, pads for teens. And by the end of the 50s, they started to suggest the use of tampons for teenagers too. On the contrary, in Argentina, in the end of the, by the end of the 60s, the educational material that I found was still suggesting just the use of pads for young women. Um, and I have to say here that the companies had a great work in trying to eliminate social and personal fears over tampon as something that could make women lose uh, something really valuable for our societies as virginity or they could incite uh, masturbation. And I could add one more characteristic of the ideal menstruator. If the rigid standard of how a normal menstruation should be doesn't apply for your her particular case, the ideal menstruator should go to the doctor. Finally, the educational materials of the companies did one more thing. They prohibited some activities during menstruation that today seem to be ridiculous. Uh, some were very similar as what traditional knowledge used to advise, for example, not taking a bath or a cold bath or doing energetic movements. And while the decades passed uh, by, they eliminated all those prohibitions, and that seemed to coincide with the moment in which the tampon became suggested for teenagers. So I tried to show you uh, how the normalization of the menstrual body during the con a considerable part of the 20th century helped to maximize uh, women's bodies' productivity while reinscribing traditional gender narratives in many different levels. And as a result of this new disciplinary practice towards women's bodies, not only all the traces of menstruation were concealed, but the menstrual stigma was better concealed too. So this work presents a historical and transnational frame that allows to understand why this way of menstruating is currently in dispute. I would refer to this point to close my presentation because it opens new questions for further research that pursue to continue a genealogical work that, uh, about women's menstrual bodies to the present. And there are some new narratives um, around menstruation in the femcare industry of central countries, and I have to say that none of this is happening in Argentina. Uh, they still maintain menstrual stigma because they are advertising pads and tampons to efficiently conceal menstruation, but they are deepening the rhetoric of women's empowerment. A couple of examples are the following. The first one, uh, an ad of Always brand, a Procter & Gamble brand for the American market, shows a generational change in the experience of being a woman towards uh, what we can call self-confidence. But menstruation, you will see, is never mentioned. Let's take a look. This campaign is called Like a Girl. Hi. Uh, hi. OK, so I'm going to just give you some actions to do and just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. <laughs>
run like a girl. <laughs> so do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really is. If it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swim like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. <laughs> if somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring and you're still getting to the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl and that is not something that I should be ashamed of so I'm going to do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? run like a girl also mean win the race. Rewrite the rules. So the second one is an ad of body form from UK and it talks about a blood that should not hold us back but it relates with the it is related with the pain and the effort of practicing a sport professionally. And menstruation again is still a metaphor. This campaign is called Blood. fearless. So this is what is new under the sun in the femcare industry rhetoric to refer to menstruation in advertisements. But in addition, new technologies of menstrual management started to uh, have a strong presence in the market from the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. On the one hand, new reusable products such as the menstrual cup or pads made of fabric that you can use, wash, and reuse. The panties that includes um, that include a sort of a fabric pad, such as things, uh, they pretend to break the menstrual taboo, but they are still trying to guarantee the efficiency uh, in avoiding the leaking. So um, I use quotes in the word "new" because. Um, as you probably know, some of them are not new at all, and especially the menstrual cup. Here you can see uh, that there are many patterns of menstrual cups in the 30s here in the US. 
These technologies uh, are supported by discourses related to um, ecofeminism and some others that relate menstruation with uh, positive, powerful, very essential connotations of women's uh, organisms. These texts, uh, these technologies are a real reaction to the menstrual taboo that the fem care industry perpetuated uh, under the rhetorics of liberation, not only by conceal of, uh, for concealing menstruation, but also because all the unhealthy issues related with uh, dioxins or dioxins and other toxic substances found in pads and tampons. The, mo the most renowned episode was related with the toxic uh, shock syndrome in the late uh, 70s here in the US, but there are uh, still many studies in the US and in Argentina that nowadays find uh, toxic substances in industrial pads and tampons. And just related with the unhealthy issues uh, of pads and tampons, there are also new tampons made of organic cotton and some new brands, uh, technologies like tampons with um, vibrators to relieve the menstrual cr cramps. On the other hand, other significant industry, uh, the pharmaceutical one, started to commercialize massively last generation contraceptives that suppress the menstrual cycle. They are supported by biomedical discourses that believe that menstruation is unuseful and even harmful for women's uh, health. Elsie Marcoutinho, you may know him, is one of the biggest exponents of this discourse. These contraceptive uh, methods uh, are advertised in the US as a convenient way to get rid of the burden of menstruation, not only as a way of avoiding very important health issues related with the menstrual cycle. And from the results of my research, my hypothesis is that the femcare industry helped women disidentify with the menstrual body during the past, la la the past century and helped the pharmaceutical industry go for a more radical solution, the menstrual suppression. On the one hand, the femcare, the femcare industry needs women to bleed as much as possible, and on the other side, the pharmaceutical industry needs women to uh, feel blood as an inconvenient. Finally, some words about the field of menstrual activism, very well understood by Chris Bovell, uh, as, a, as a part of a third wave of feminism. Menstrual activism tends to support the reusable methods that portray menstruation as a positive experience of women's bodies. And they work to do uh, many things, including getting menstru menstruation out of the closet, closet. All the social media reactions related to what I showed you at the beginning of these presentations, I mean the practice of free, free bleeding, the social exposure of uh, leaking, um, or just uh, the disclosure that women menstruate in certain territories traditionally masculine, such as sports, can be read as signs of a well-nurtured and a still alive menstrual stigma. In the 21st century, we can say that we made great advancements in the feminist agenda, but gender equity is still and incompletely conquered. The lethal violence against women is based in the, in the more pervasive, uh, gentle, productive, and subtle violence, like the symbolic violence uh, toward women, as I described it. And the most interesting part of the story is that that violence is concealed under the look of a discourse of women's liberation or women empo women's empowerment. So I would like to end my presentation saying that feminism is not a bad word. We need feminism, which is not an anti-man movement as the media and some common sense thinking like to portray it. Feminism is a way to understand and expose social inequalities related with sex gender system in all its intersectionality with different forms of social oppressions. This is to say that if feminism is a bad word, it's an essential bad word. Um, and we need more feminist research, but we also need to take uh, take it out of the papers and the books and the scientific events. We also need action and concrete change. So as I said, I would like to finish with the voice of Rupi Kaur in her public answer to Instagram after they censor her image of uh, menstrual leakage. And I'm paraphrasing Rupi Kaur as if Insta Instagram was just a voice like any other voice of a society that thinks that a symbolic violence against women is a minor issue. 
She said, uh, thank you, Instagram, for providing me with the exact response my work was created to critique. You deleted my photo twice, stating that it goes against community guidelines. I will not apologize for not feeding the ego and pride of misogynist society that will have my body under an underwear, but not be okay with a small leak when your papers uh, when your pages are filled with countless photos and accounts where women, so many who are underage, are objectified, pornified, and treated less than human. Thank you. Thank you so very much. interesting because um, maybe it's the male gaze it's not men just men right and it's not performing uh, an ideal femininity for men actually uh, you get like uh, not a very nice reaction when you uh, talk with women and you say something like this uh, they'd say I don't dress for men for example mm -hmm. some uh, some some women don't like to hear that I think that um, the intersection of the male gaze, it's a, a strong uh, cultural other um, that I tried to show something related with this in this uh, study that, that has actually uh, Foucault in, in the base. Um, I don't know if I answer what, well, it's like a reflection, right? Um, yeah, I would say something like this. It's like the male gaze uh, surveillance. Yeah. I'm interested to know what you think about the, um, they're going to sell feminine products now without checking them. Oh, oh yes. It's interesting. I, I think that New York is already doing that, right? Um, I think that, that it's great because um, well, in the 70s, um, there was written a very nice essay um, about what, hap what would happen if men could menstruate mm -hmm. and from Gloria Steinman. And she said that pads and tampons would be free, <laughs> probably, <laughs> between many other things. Well, actually, I think that it's, a, it's an interesting um, initiative because uh, this is one of the things that we are asked to perform, to, we, we are asked to conceal menstruation to perform uh, an ideal femininity, so at least they should get rid of the tax uh, from the products. So I think it's a good initiative. But it's also good to um, uh, disseminate, to disseminate, well, what is happening with the toxic, uh, toxic substances that they are still found in pads and tampons. Um, I'm, I am not sure of um, how dangerous they are, but I read many current papers on that. Uh, so I don't know if the industry has enough uh, strength to hide uh, those uh, results of these studies, but 
Um, I think that it's a good initiative, but at the same time, I'm like a little bit worried about uh, these findings. Uh, probably the menstrual cup is the best uh, technology, the more I innocuous uh, technology. Well, and some other thing that I would like to add to that answer is that, for example, in Argentina, we have a, a public national uh, program of reproductive health. And we have like a big variety of contraceptives that are free for, for poor women and for women from low social status. And they don't have any technology to manage menstruation. And actually, when we have like a natural disaster in Argentina, probably here it happens the same. I am not sure, but in Argentina they don't give you, they don't give women uh, menstrual management technologies. It's, I think that it's so um, so well uh, hidden that they forget about women's needs. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Talk. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.